Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include Russia suggests EU think about cooperation in European Eurasian integration processes. European Union citizens force water debate onto the agenda. Plan to cut child benefit paid to EU migrants will be vetoed, says Brussels. EU referendum? Britain would vote to stay in, Nick Clegg predicts. Plus, after Owen Jones' open letter to UKIP voters last week, here is Nigel Farage's reply. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from our homepage. The customs union is not a geopolitical rival of the European Union, and it is necessary to think about cooperation between the European and Eurasian integration processes, Russia's envoy to the EU, Vladimir Chizhov, said. This is the essence of the customs union's proposal to the EU, Chizhov said, when speaking on January 13th at the European Policy Centre in Brussels. Russia immediately accepted the offer of Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych to hold trilateral talks between Ukraine, Russia and the EU regarding the possible consequences of Kiev's European integration, while Brussels rejected it at once, Chishov said. Now, taking a step back, there are so many that cry conspiracy the moment anyone mentions New World Order. Well, unless it's an elected president or minister. And this confuses me. The evidence on the ground, European Union, Eurasian Union, North American Union and the African Union, each of these constructs is real. They are being built under the guise of a single trading bloc. And yet their policies and governance extend far beyond trade. The United Nations formerly the League of Nations, has and still is today acting like a catalyst to bring about a single world government. And we can see without a doubt this is where we are heading, and yet our leaders and media call these ideas conspiracy and fictional notions of cranks. It seems incredible to us here at the unit that they are attempting to hide the truth in plain sight and hope to get away with it. Let us know what you think. Do you feel that a one world government is the longer term goal? Water, and who should provide it, the public or private sector, has become the first issue to be pushed onto Brussels' policy agenda via a new mechanism meant to involve ordinary people in EU decision-making. The EU Citizens' Initiative was introduced in 2012 following changes to the EU treaty that were designed to bring lawmaking closer to the EU's 500 million people. It gives citizens the rights to make policy proposals on any issue as long as they have secured one million signatures spread across at least seven of the EU's 28 member states, although it does not guarantee lawmakers will pass the legislation. Late in December, organisers of the Right to Water initiative formally submitted their proposal after exceeding the threshold. They say the human right to water should be enshrined in EU law and that public, not private companies, should be responsible for providing water services. Now, for those folks out there that still think the EU is just a trading bloc, a common market, well, perhaps this story might persuade you that without your knowledge and without your consent, your rights under the Constitution of Britain have been given away for shiny trinkets desired by a corrupt political elite. Now, your new masters, the unelected European Commission, invite you to collaborate with at least seven other nations and petition over a million people to sign up to your cause. Then, and only then, might they consider your point of view. Now remember folks, you can deal directly with your regional MP, but, as you'll discover soon when we begin our own on-the-spot campaign, your MEP is a powerless puppet nodding dog who is instructed behind closed doors on how to vote. Did you know your MEP is penalised financially for non-participation in EU voting? And notice that should an MEP have a voice of opposition in the Bruswellian hemicircle, nobody is ever listening. 
Go check out some of the YouTube videos of MEPs voicing the opinions of their constituents to an enormous, empty parliamentary dome. The government's plans to cut the child benefit paid to some EU migrants working in Britain will be vetoed by other member states, Brussels has warned. David Cameron and Nick Clegg agree that people from other countries whose families remain in their home country while they work in the UK, should not be able to draw British levels of child benefit. The payments of £20.30 a week for the first child and £13.40 for each additional one are much more generous than those in Eastern European countries such as Poland, Romania and Bulgaria. In 2012, about 24,000 EU migrants claimed child benefit in Britain, even though their children did not live in the country. Now, this next section of the story is key, and it demonstrates the EU's ratchet mechanism at work. Once powers have been handed to Brussels, there is no way to get them back. Cameron and Clegg are both complicit in deceiving us here in the UK. They know that they cannot successfully implement this, but they're playing the political long game. Here's what the article has to say. Any one of these countries could veto the government's attempt to pay local rather than UK child benefit rates to such workers in Britain, because a change in the rules would need the backing of all 28 EU member states. So there you have it, folks. And this is true for repatriation of powers of any sort. So if you thought that renegotiation of powers is going to become a reality, then think again. There is only one way to bring back control and governance to Westminster, our MPs and our local councillors, and that, my friends is to leave the European Union. Britain would opt to remain inside the European Union if the issue is ever put to vote, as Nick Clegg has said. The unexpected prediction from the Deputy Prime Minister comes amid a storm of activity from Conservative Eurosceptics as the long campaigning season ahead of May's European elections begins in earnest. Clegg insisted the British people would ultimately appreciate we can win in the world by being open if his coalition colleague David Cameron gets his referendum in the next parliament. I personally believe that when and if there is a referendum, I don't think the British people would vote for an exit, he told BBC One's The Andrew Marr Show. Now, Joseph Goebbels said... He who controls the information runs the show, and we think it very much depends on what the media and our politicians present. Think about it for a moment. Despite many, many requests, and in spite of so much controversy, the government refuses to conduct a cost-benefit analysis over Britain's membership of the EU. Surely, if all this trade and all these jobs outweighed, or indeed even balanced the cost to the UK taxpayer, then such an analysis would resolve the issue once and for all. Yet, up until now, and it is our opinion that toward and beyond any such referendum, no such assessment will be undertaken. One has to ask the question, why? We got a copy of Nigel Farage's letter in response to the letter published in The Independent by Owen Jones. I fear that you may have been reading too much into statistical samples and haven't taken the time to get out and meet UKIP voters. That is what fundamentally unites our party. The phrasing of questions and surveys will not divert attention from the fact that we know that the issues which affect our everyday lives stem, in the majority, from the EU. So when UKIP voters talk about their main issues being immigration, energy prices, healthcare, housing, or even what bulbs they will soon be allowed to purchase at their local garden centre. They all come under the umbrella of an EU issue. Further into the letter, Nigel highlights the incoming energy crisis we face here in Britain. The EU Large Combustion Plant Directive, a headline grabber of title I know, sets limits on emissions of pollutants. Power stations had until 2008 to comply with these rules or opt out. A third of the UK's coal-fired power stations did this, meaning they can only run for a maximum of 20,000 hours and must close by the 31st of December 2015 at the latest. And I'm afraid for you, that is the same story with our railways. 
but not in the way you envisage. You see, our rail privatisation occurred as part of an EU directive too. It's a conversation I have had with Bob Crow, who is very keen to renationalise the railways, but we can't do this as members of the European Union. Again. I agree that we must make work pay and boost demand in the economy, but endless Keynesianisms and debt financing does not work. And the real point about the minimum wage is that in an age of uncontrolled immigration, and possibly even without it, the minimum wage becomes the maximum wage. Now this is such a good letter and is full of well thought out and well supported facts. Frankly, we need more of this kind of frank and open discussion in British politics. The people of the UK are not retarded. We do not need things simplified or skimmed over. What we need are solid, reliable truths. Because, like them as not, at least with the truth, we have something to work with. Today, let's take a look through what our research team have discovered in our European Union legislation section. The European Globalisation Adjustment Fund was set up in order to provide assistance to workers who have been negatively affected by major structural changes in world trade patterns. So what does that lot mean? Well, let's take a look and see what the requests were for. Denmark submitted an application regard to DK Vestas for a financial contribution from the EGF fund following 611 redundancies in the Vestas group. And Finland submitted application EGF 2013-001 following 4,509 redundancies at Nokia. Germany submitted application EGF 2013-03 for First Solar for a financial contribution from the EGF fund following 959 redundancies in the Enterprise First Solar Manufacturing GmbH. So, as you can see, the European economic recovery, given so much hype at the opening of the year, is apparently in full swing. Next, the EU published this Development and State Building in South Sudan report, which urges Sudan and Southern Sudan to implement fully the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which calls on the two states to tackle issues concerning power sharing, citizenship, oil revenues and debt sharing. And it also sets out a framework for European aid for South Sudan, including agriculture, democratic governance, the rule of law, education and health, capacity building and South Sudanese legal system and promoting access to education and sexual and reproductive rights and healthcare services for women. Next we have updates and amendments to the common fisheries policy. The main elements of the recommendation are as follows. Overfishing must be stopped. The aim is for this to be achieved by 2015 in order to permit fish stocks to begin to recover. Postponing this date to the latest 2020 is only permitted if the social and economic sustainability of the fishing fleet is severely jeopardised. Now the principle of maximum sustainable yield must be legally binding rather than simply a political declaration, allowing stocks to recover beyond just a sustainable level. And all catches must be landed, i.e. there is going to be a ban on all discards. Exemptions to the ban on discards may only apply where it is shown to be difficult for the fishermen concerned to fish more selectively or where the processing of bycatches would entail disproportionately high costs. Regarding overcapacity, member states must ensure that their catch capacities are in line with resources. Member states must examine their fleet's catch capacities every year in accordance with the criteria set down by the Commission. Of course, the other rather radical solution to this conundrum might be to simply allow Britain to take back control of her fishing waters, which make up 70% of the EU fishing grounds, and for the UK government to invest in fish farming diversification programmes for harbours and fleets across the country, enabling provision of fish to the industry via segregated farming practices and leaving external waters completely fallow, which would enable the ecological environment to recover. Now... At the beginning, I called that radical, but perhaps it's more just common sense. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>